Uh, welcome to the Digital Civil Society Spring Speaker Series. Thanks for being here today. I hope everybody's safe and doing as well as possible. I'm Lucy Bernholtz. I'm the director of the Digital Civil Society Lab. Uh, the goal of the lab is to inform and understand civil society in a digitally dependent world. Uh, we do this through fellowships, research, events, and teaching and by engaging a wide range of audiences, including scholars from various disciplines, community advocates, technologists, and policymakers. This event today is part of our speaker series, Communication 230X. This series provides a forum for scholars and community-based innovators to present their work, learn from those working on related issues from, a different, dis from different disciplinary perspectives, and spark or nurture cross-disciplinary engagement around the big questions that animate the Digital Civil Society Lab. Today, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Deb Raji, who I will introduce very shortly. Thanks, Deb, for being here, and I can't wait for your talk. Before that, three quick housekeeping items. Uh, we're going to be recording the, the presentation, um, part of the seminar, but not the question and answers. Um, the series doubles as a class. So when it comes to the questions and answers, we will give priority to the students in the class. Um, and you can feel free to use the question and answer function or uh, raise your hand. And then finally, if you're interested in attending future talks, visit our website at um, the Digital Civil Society Lab and you'll see our whole uh, lineup of speakers. So it's my pleasure to in introduce uh, Deborah Raji, who is a Nigerian Canadian computer scientist and activist working on algorithmic bias, AI accountability, and algorithmic auditing. She's worked at Google, the partnership on AI, AI uh, the AI Now Institute, and is currently a fellow at the Mozilla Foundation studying algorithmic auditing and evaluation. Um, Deb's work on bias in facial recognition has been highlighted in the 2020 documentary Coded Bias, which is now available to everybody on Netflix, or at least everybody who can borrow somebody's Netflix password. So I won't keep talking because it's more important to hear from Deb than from me. Deb, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, we'll save questions and answers to the end if that's what you prefer. And um, thank you again for making the time to join us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I, I prefer questions uh, at the very end. Um, I'll try to, I guess, how much time uh, would you prefer for me to like leave for questions? Um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Possibly. Okay, yeah, that, that works. Um, so yeah, happy to take questions at the end um, and, and sort of keep this to time. Um, so yeah, today I'm gonna talk about uh, the challenges of audits, accountability, and algorithmic justice. So to give a bit of background, I'm currently a Mozilla fellow, but I work very closely with the Algorithmic Justice League, which was founded by Joy Bulemwini. And um, you know, our work on facial recognition bias, the gender shade study is this, it's the topic of the coded bias documentary on Netflix. It's um, it was sort of very heavily featured in the news. And I'm gonna mention sort of lessons that we've learned from that work, but also um, you know, how that's informed are uh, sort of other endeavors into algorithmic accountability. So um, to just sort of like ground the conversation, I'm gonna be talking a lot about this idea of engineering responsibility. So it's this situation where, you know, individuals sort of build, uh, you know, uh, engineering artifact, think of like a bridge or a, a car, and they actually were not very thoughtful in their construction of these artifacts. So. Um, in the case of this, uh, to the left, you have the sort of the Quebec Bridge, which was the construction of, uh, you know, Theodore Cooper uh, was sort of the lead engineer on the bridge. And uh, in the early sort of, uh, uh, in like 1907, the, the bridge collapsed and about 75 uh, construction workers on that bridge uh, died in that collapse. And it was a horrible sort of engineering accident, well known as one of the, you know, the worst uh, at the time. And, uh, you know, for the first time ever, you know, in the in the report, uh, you know, following the incident, they they put the the blame very squarely on Theodore Cooper's shoulders, where they said he did not do a good job as an engineer. You know, doing due diligence with respect to how the bridge was constructed, he didn't ask the right questions. He wasn't paying attention to um, appeals from other construction workers about you know different potential failures, and he kind of failed in his role as an engineer to to keep everyone safe. Um, and then about, you know, quite a few decades later in like about the 1960s or 70s, um, Ralph Nader made a very similar argument about the deployment of cars. So, he, uh, you know, 
there's pictures of the Chevrolet Colbert, which is a very, you know, sporty, a sporty, cool car from the 60s and 70s. And it had very poor steering capabilities. It was very dangerous and actually very prone to getting accidents, uh, getting into accidents. Um, and uh, Ralph Nader made the argument that, you know, the engineers that were sort of designing and constructing these cars were not being thoughtful about how they were doing that. They weren't putting safety at you know the forefront of their considerations, and thus they had these very poorly constructed cars that were putting people at risk. Um, so th these conversations are conversations around engineering responsibility. Pretty much, you know, the person that's building that system uh, puts individuals at risk by virtue of not doing a good job building it. So we, we see a lot of these examples in the press today for algorithms, for, for algorithmic products, which are, you know, is a situation where you, know, you might have uh, an AI product that's deployed into the world and it fails or it collapses in very serious ways. So you have you know, algorithms that you know, give people the wrong grades or you know, misdiagnose them or uh, excludes them from a particular service. And it's due to you know, a lack of oversight, a lack of, task of you know, appropriate task design, or just a lack of reflecting on how, to, you know, how the product might perform on different demographic groups. So I'm gonna talk today about you know, uh, a couple important reminders to contextualize the conversation of the kind of work we do versus you know, other topics you might've heard of. Uh, with respect to this, I'm going to talk about algorithmic accountability and what we mean by that. And then I'm going to dig into this issue of engineering responsibility, which is really a, you know, one of the issues that we deal the most with in our work. I'm going to talk about you know, how we address engineering responsibility issues you know, with audits, with regulation, and with uh, recalls. And then I'm going to talk about other challenges that also arise that are worth talking about. So I'm going to start with a couple important reminders and try to do this very quickly. But you know, one reminder is that I don't know if you've seen another Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma. It's very popular, and it sort of presents this uh, image of you know youth being addicted to social media and that causing a lot of damage to their mental health and to their ability to navigate the world. Um, successfully. And, you know, it kind of presents it as this individual dilemma of like their main message is, you know, turn off your phone, opt out, just, just turn it off. But actually, you know, a lot of the algorithmic deployments that we work with or that we, or that we, um, we need to sort of, uh, you know, hold institutions accountable for are not algorithms that we can just turn off or opt out of. Uh, you know, these are systems that are imposed on individuals and communities, often without any level of consent or um, agency, and they don't always have users that intersect with the affected population. So you might have an algorithm that's being used by a police department affecting a community, um, or an algorithm being, you know, used by doctors or hospital affecting patients. Algorithms being used by teachers or school affecting students. So that users don't always intersect with the affected population and these um, systems can be you know imposed on individuals without notice without consent and without their participation so they just it's it, you know the the option of opting out or turning it off is not always there uh, the second important reminder is this idea of the fact that the real world is full of Roombas. Um, so I don't know how many people might have seen you know Sophia the robot it's this very futuristic slick robot um, and people kind of have that as the image of what AI is or what robotics is, is this very slick humanoid, you know, thing. But in reality, you know, the most widely deployed commercial robot uh, in the world and specifically in the U.S. Uh, today is, is the Roomba. And it's, the, the Roomba is like, you know, not very complicated, uh, you know, it, it bumps into walls, it, it, it makes so many mistakes. Um, and, but there's, there's millions of them um, and they're much more uh, widely deployed than anything else. So real world algorithms are a lot like Roombas and not very much like Sophia. So they're often very simple. They're not very complicated, uh, technically speaking, and they're deployed at scale. So to the order of you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of people impacted. Uh, the other important reminder is that there's urgency to this work because there's real people being affected. Um, uh, a lot of the work that the Algorithmic Justice League does and a lot of other sort of uh, advocacy groups in this space, the, the, the work we do is related to real world deployments of AI products or algorithmic products. So nothing is hypothetical or rhetorical. Uh, you know, real people are impacted by these deployments. Um, and so the outcomes we're talking about are real and the threat is real and the risk is very real. Oh, and here's a picture of Robert Williams. 
which was, you know, a, a real man that was misidentified by a facial recognition system, and, and that led to a false arrest. Um, uh, this is a, you know, sub reminder, a way to sort of pull some of the, those reminders together, but, uh, you know, I think sometimes when people talk about, you know, ethics and uh, AI systems, uh, they're thinking of, you know, the self-driving car, is it going to hit the baby or is it going to hit the grandma, you know, this moral machine dilemma. Um, but, you know, like I mentioned, there's about 1400 self-driving cars tested across, you know, the entire country by about 80 plus companies. Um, you know, there's not, it's not actually a material risk that a lot of people have to worry about in this moment. You know, much bigger risk is this algorithm affecting 100 million people throughout California that was found to be uh, uh, racially biased against uh, black patients versus white patients. So, um, you know, disproportionately flagging white patients as needing care when they didn't, and then disproportionately uh, ignoring black patients that needed more care. So, you know, it's this sort of scale of algorithms, but also like a, it's, this is a much more simpler thing than a self-driving car um, that, that we sort of focus on. So again, to that, the world is full of Roomba's point. So the first question I wanna uh, talk about is this idea of what is algorithmic accountability? What do we mean when we actually, you know, want to hold these real world uh, algorithms to account? Uh, so here is sort of a definition. It's very, it's a very technical definition, but it comes from a great, uh, uh, a, a great uh, survey paper by uh, Waranga, um, so where she sort of surveys the conversation or the discourse happening around algorithmic accountability and uh, grounds that definition in in sort of a longstanding tradition of accountability. Uh, discourse and literature, where she 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 mentions that accountability is really about you know demanding information from you know certain stakeholders that have the ability to act on a situation, and then passing judgment on that stakeholder based off of the information that they provide in order for there to be consequences. Um, so if you know there's a situation where someone can change change that situation, um, we're allowed to request information and pass a judgment on them. For, the, for there to be consequences. Um, so what that practically means is that, you know, let's take the example of the A-level um, uh, algorithm where, uh, you know, you had this algorithm, because of COVID, students were not able to sit for their uh, A-level, their final exams uh, for high school. And as a result, um, you know, uh, multiple countries throughout the UK decided that they want, they, they would use an algorithm to adjust the grades that the teachers had provided for these students based off of their coursework, uh, you know, using an algorithm that was informed by, you know, the, the, the history of, um, of uh, you know, uh, the grades that were provided for that particular region or that particular school, maybe the history of uh, other students that shared particular characteristics with that, with the student in question. They used this algorithm to sort of adjust the grades for multiple students. And it was discovered that the grades were disproportionately downgraded in lower income regions uh, for public schools and disproportionately upgraded for private school students and in higher income regions. And this is something that affected hundreds and thousands of students throughout the UK. Um, and, you know, the students really reacted to this. They, they identified different actors, different stakeholders in the ecosystem that could take action on the situation. And then they demanded information about, you know, how the system worked, but more importantly, uh, they, they threatened consequences. So they, they, they protested, they demanded, um, you know, the removal of the, of the, of the algorithms grades to, to sort of trust their teachers to, to make that, de that decision for them. So this is a situation where it's not just a question of, can we measure for fairness? Can we report a result? But um, can we actually change the circumstances of those that are impacted by this situation to, uh, to get them to justice? Um, but you'll notice, you know, as part of this definition, a really important conversation needs to happen about who is this actor. So there's multiple stakeholders involved, you know, who's actually responsible, who are we demanding information from, and who do we want the consequences to impact? So, you know, you could, there's multiple potential actors, there's governments, there's, you know, policymakers, po product developers, uh, you know, the data subjects themselves, institutional operators, so many different people, right? So, um, you know, several of these stakeholders determine a model's capacity to do harm. If we want different outcomes from that model, from, the, from that model or from that system, you know, who needs to take action and who, who needs to face consequences? 
So I'm going to talk about, you know, one framing of algorithmic accountability, which is this challenge of engineering responsibility. So engineering responsibility is a situation where the actor is the those that are building the tools. So we're asking, you know, how can we hold those that are building the tools to account in a way it, about the, uh, you know, about the ways in which they might build a product that might hurt people. So uh, to give some examples of when this is the case, you know, one example is with the Midas unemployment uh, system. So this was uh, uh, an algorithm that was meant to detect, automatically detect uh, uh, fraud in unemployment applications. But, um, you know, it was discovered that the, the system had a 94% error rate when uh, independently audited. And what that led to was about, you know, 85% of the cases resulting in an incorrect fraud determination, meaning, you know, tens and thousands of people being falsely accused of uh, unemployment, uh, of fraud with their unemployment applications. Uh, later on, it was discovered that the reason for this was because the developers of the system did not do an appropriate migration from a legacy system. So they didn't, they didn't properly copy over the data from you know, a historical database into the database that was being used by this algorithm. So it was a technical oversight, a lack of testing, a lack of proper framing of the problem, a lot of engineering failures. Um, and most importantly, the decisions that led to the harm that people experienced were decisions made by uh, the institution or the, the company that built these systems. Another example of you know, failed engineering responsibility is the case with Uber, where um, you know, Uber, I'm sure you've heard of Uber's uh, you know, deadly car crash, Later on, an investigation discovered that you know one of the reasons for the car crash was the inability of the Uber system to identify uh, you know pedestrians that were off of the sidewalk, um, and you know obviously this is uh, an incredible oversight in testing and a lack of uh, responsibility and due diligence in terms of thinking about these safety features, these required safety features. Um, so you know when we encounter failures of engineering responsibility, what can we do? So one thing we can do is we can audit these systems. Um, oops. Uh, so audits can either happen on the outside of uh, the institution or on the inside of uh, the institution building these, um, these products. So an internal audit is you know, think of like IBM, Google, Microsoft's responsible innovation teams, um, you know, uh, Accenture's responsible. So Accenture is sort of like a, a technical software consultant, uh, consultancy company where they will come in, um, they'll be hired by a company to come in or a company like Orca, which is again, another audit consultancy where they'll be hired by the company to come in. So internal audits are characterized by the fact that, you know, those auditors have direct access to the system. They're often hired by the company to come in and take a second look at the product. Um, it's usually pre-deployment. So you, they go through the audit process before they deploy the system. And then it's, it's, there's a focus on compliance and quality control. So it's usually about looking at, um, you know, the performance of the system relative to some kind of external uh, expectations around, you know, AI principles maybe, or any kind of legal framework that they might be accountable to. An external audit um, is often conducted by regulators like NIST or the FDA, um, uh, maybe journalists, investigative journalists like the Markup or ProPublica, uh, you know, government accountability offices or, or independent government accountability boards um, or advocacy groups like AJL, ACLU or Upturn. And these external audits are indirect. We have indirect or uh, consumer level access to the system. So we don't you know, directly see everything. Uh, post deployment, so most of the uh, external audits will happen after an issue has been flagged post deployment. Um, and also uh, you know, executed by these sort of independent third party bodies that are not paid by the company. Uh, and are, you know, and their, their, their focus is not necessarily on compliance or control. They don't really care. <laughs> they, they care more about protecting the represented groups. So um, an external audit has a focus on sort of prioritizing, you know, addressing concerns of a protected or represented group. So, you know, this idea of auditing uh, from the outside uh, or an external audit has been in literature, you know, for, for quite some time. Um, uh, you know, not just by regulatory bodies, but, you know, by academic researchers as well, like particularly the 
uh, HCI community has been auditing uh, online platforms for, for, for quite a few years. Um, but we, you know, with gender shades, we realized that there were particular challenges to the audit processes in these past audits. So for one thing, you know, the benchmarks, the evaluation data sets that were being used as part of these audits were quite biased. Um, and we learned a lot from anti-discrimination law to think about intersectionality and in the evaluation of these bench, uh, of these, of these, uh, these products and really inform a more inclusive benchmarking process. Uh, the other sort of issue with, uh, current audit practice uh, in like the academic realm was sort of this issue of accessing the target. And I won't get too much into it, but we, we looked a lot at the HCI audits and try to identify, you know, how that might translate to a machine learning space where you, you know, you need to access the model and isolate the model that you're auditing for. Uh, the other thing that, you know, was a huge challenge was public pressure where, um, you know, uh, these audits, these audit papers would get published and the companies would either ignore the results or it would be published and the, the companies would be anonymous they wouldn't even know that they were being audited so we took a lot of uh cues from financial auditing and you know we publicly named multiple targets uh, and then the sort of final thing we were worried about was this hostile corporate reaction where um you know people that would release these audit studies would be faced with a lawsuit or they would be um encountering you know a lot of resistance from these companies and uh, we learned a lot from information security on how to deal with that so, um, you know, one of the big contributions of gender shades, like I mentioned, was addressing this benchmark bias issue where, you know, PPB is the data set that was used for the gender shades evaluation. And if you look at it in comparison to all the other facial recognition data sets in use at the time, you can tell that PPB was sort of much more intentionally curated to be balanced with respect to gender representation and uh, skin type representation. And as a result of just that basic fact, we were able to evaluate the performance of, you know, these commercial uh, facial recognition products on uh, these different demographic subgroups and identify that, you know, performance on the darker female subgroup was significantly lower than performance on, you know, the best performing subgroup, which was the lighter male subgroup. About a year later, we reevaluated the systems and we found that that was a consistent pattern across the industry. Um, and, you know, later on, other external auditors, uh, such as NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they adopted and, you know, they cited our work and they adopted a similar procedure where they began to evaluate the performance of their system on these different demographic groups. And what they found was that Asian and African American people were up to 100 times more likely to be misidentified than white men. Um, other examples of external audits, uh, you know, further work by other researchers finding evidence of bias and facial recognition expression data sets. Um, uh, you know, another study by NIST looking at face masks and how that affects performance of different on different demographic groups by, by these facial recognition tools. Um, and then also sort of another form of uh, external audit, which was sort of the pilot um, that came about afterwards as well, which is this idea of, you know, in order to assess the functionality of the system um, in, a, in a context, in the context that we're worried about as an advocacy group, uh, we're going to, you know, purchase the product and, and, and test it in the wild. And, and Big Brother um, UK, which is sort of, uh, Big Brother Watch UK, which is sort of a, an advocacy group in the UK uh, concerned about privacy issues, uh, they did just that and they found that UK's facial recognition system you know, had an 81% error rate, which means it was, it was wrong 81% of the time. Uh, MTA also, you know, had, you know, regulatory body uh, do a pilot study and they found a 0% accuracy rate. So it was always wrong in every instance of the pilot. Um, and, and, you know, uh, other, other researchers have sort of taken, taken on that, that uh, pilot uh, audit stance as well in order to really hold some of these institutions to uh, some, some of these companies to account by, by pointing out the failures of their products. Uh, one of the issues though, with uh, you know, auditing as a, as a mechanism for uh, accountability, especially as an external auditor, is that you, you get locked out immediately. So after we audited Kairos, um, you know, we, they immediately put up a paywall and in order to now use their product, you have to click on this, you have to pay hundred dollars a month, but also as part of you know, the terms and conditions for the purchase, you have to agree to not audit their product. So, um, you know, as soon as we started auditing as an external auditor, we also get kind of, uh, as soon as people become aware of the potential to get audited, they, they block that, uh, they block your ability to do so. 
Another challenge with auditing as an accountability mechanism is that, you know, you have uh, some of these corporate responses that are not always quite appropriate once you release the audit. So you release the audit in order to demonstrate that, you know, this technology does not work, uh, you know, and it's, and it's harmful in the, in a, to, to the, the, the sort of community that we care about. Uh, so you need to change it, you know, and, uh, you know, some of the reactions to that work uh, really surprised us. So one reaction is that IBM decided that they needed to accumulate, you know, as many faces as possible um, to train more diverse, you know, to train models that would perform better on more diverse faces. Similarly, you know, Chinese companies decided to, uh, you know, purchase faces from different African governments in order to diversify their data sets. And we were fully against that, <laughs> you know, it, it, those moves might have resulted in products that did better on our benchmark, but they caused, you know, another dimension of harm with respect to exploitation, consent, privacy issues, tokenization. Um, so those reactions were, you know, completely inappropriate and, and kind of um, uh, came out of left field. Uh, the other sort of challenge with auditing as an accountability mechanism is this idea of uh, scope where, you know, when you conduct and design an audit, you have to be really specific about the demographic group, the prediction task, and the company that you're auditing for. We audited Microsoft and Amazon for their ability to achieve sort of the, 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 um, the facial analysis task of gender classification. And, uh, you know, after being audited, they minimized the disparity in performance between the darker female subgroup and, you know, other subgroups. Um, and, you know, they were able to sort of make the, the disparity minimal between these uh, different subgroups for the gender classification task. But for the age classification task, which we had not audited them for yet, they still had about a 30% disparity between, you know, the lighter male or lighter female subgroup and the darker female subgroup. Um, so that was just demonstrative of the fact that, you know, when you audit for a very specific demographic group or prediction task, um, you know, the companies will only react to that. Additionally, companies that were not previously audited, such as Clarify, consistently had that disparity between, you know, the best performing and worst performing subgroups. So you only really impact the companies that you audit for, uh, for the prediction tasks that you audit for, for the demographic groups that you audit for explicitly. Uh, the other thing as well about auditing is that, you know, um, auditing doesn't account for some of these issues of, you know, pseudoscientific objectives like, uh, you know, uh, predicting criminality from the face, character or personality from the face. Uh, you, you can't really design an audit to demonstrate that these are harmful products. Uh, you know, you have to sort of make a, a logical or rhetorical argument uh, against these things and these applications. So, um, you know, we found that uh, sort of to be a limitation of just uh, a, a sort of straightforward audit. Um, and that's one of the, in, that was one of the sort of inspirations for the Safe Face Pledge initiative that Joy had uh, started in 2018 to sort of get companies to think a little bit more holistically about their commitments uh, to, uh, you know, approaching some of these problems with a little bit more uh, reflection on, on sort of all the ways that, the, you know, their practices could cause harm beyond just bias, uh, bias uh, measurements and, and challenges with respect to um, addressing harmful bias. There's so many other aspects of the development cycle that they had to be thinking about that they weren't currently thinking about. Uh, so aside from external audits, there's also the ability to audit from the inside. Like I mentioned, you have this internal audit. Here's sort of a diagram of this idea. It's a very sort of uh, traditional audit uh, language around this idea of three lines of defense. And at the, the third line of defense is this internal audit where you have an internally independent team um, that will sort of look through the entire process and be able to identify issues in order to interface with external auditors or regulators. So the, the key sort of strategy for this in the machine learning space right now is transparency and communication um, through data documentation or, or documentation in other means. So, you know, uh, data sheets for data sets, specific sort of dimensions of that for NLP and for data licensing. Um, there's also a project that I was very involved in called Model Cards for Model Reporting, which is this idea of, you know, can we actually capture the most important parts of the model um, in order to internally communicate about, you know, the expected use cases, the limitations, the ethical considerations, just that way to sort of enforce uh, a certain amount of uh, responsibility or responsible reflection 
by those creating these systems to be able to communicate to not just internal auditors, but to their peers, their, their uh, other internal stakeholders. Um, and here's sort of an image of the first model card that Google released. Uh, it was for the Perspective API product, which is, you know, a product to help filter out toxic comments from uh, the comment section of, you know, news websites such as the New York Times. And, um, you know, they were able to release multiple uh, model cards for different versions of their model. And as part of their model card release, they actually did an uh, like an uh, sort of an internal audit of the performance of these systems for you know, different keywords, including terms for race and LGBTQ identity. And they were able to um, demonstrate that they were making improvements internally on performance for these different demographic groups. So that was something that they were able to do with the model card uh, as a sort of tool of internal accountability and internal auditing. Uh, later on, uh, as in very recently last summer, um, there was also a lot of engineering effort that went into streamlining the process for the development of the model cards as well. So outside of, you know, model cards, data sheets, AI principles, sort of product requirement documents, uh, you know, internal auditing is actually a practice that's very widely accepted in, you know, other sort of critical uh, system industries. So aer aerospace, um, uh, sort of medical devices, medical device development and finance, these are all um, other, these are other industries that really have robust internal audit cultures. Um, so, you know, we actually identified a bunch of different documents from these different industries um, that we found that we could actually pull into um, uh, the machine learning space and adapt for the machine learning community to make use of. So, you know, one example of this is the failure modes and effects analysis document where um, the, the, the purpose, this is a document that was sort of borrowed from the aerospace community where you can actually identify a feature and based off of user actions and the intended response to that action, you know, reflect on all the potential ways that that interaction could go wrong. Um, and based off of that reflection, think about the consequences of that of those failures and, and reflect on whether or not, um, you know, that failure was, you know, high severity or low severity and how easily detectable that failure was. So these are all things that we are not used to thinking about in the machine learning space at all, but has sort of been the mainstay of reflection in terms of um, you know, aerospace uh, as an industry and, and as an, an internal audit practice of aerospace. So they do this before they release the product, they go through this exercise. So we kind of reflected on what would that mean in the machine learning space? How can we adapt these tools to really um, flesh out internal audit practice in the machine learning space? So that's, that was the motivation for the Smactor framework, which was really um, uh, a resource uh, for reflecting on a more robust internal audit process. Um, so I highly encourage people that are interested in this to check out that paper. There's also this project called the About ML project, uh, which was really, uh, you know, through the partnership on AI, uh, uh, an opportunity to sort of pull together uh, documentation efforts from different communities. So, you know, Microsoft, uh, IBM, uh, at, you know, Amazon and other tech companies that were attempting Salesforce that were attempting to sort of uh, establish an internal audit practice through documentation and, and pull, pull together, you know, these different uh, uh, companies to really reflect on what best practices looks like for documentation. Uh, so the downside or the, the sort of limitation of internal auditing is, is uh, exactly what happened to my friend to Nick Gebru, where, you know, you have these internal audit teams that are meant to hold the company accountable from the inside. Um, but unfortunately, you know, you're still an employee of the company. So if you sort of make a critique or point out a failure or a risk uh, that might contradict, you know, what the company wants to do, uh, there's the possibility of you getting fired or, or, or um, being dismissed as a result of that. Uh, there's also the fact that, you know, internal auditing, uh, because you have full access to the system, it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, you know, there's so many different ways that bias can enter a system. So actually identifying all of these different uh, opportunities for bias to enter the system uh, throughout the development cycle of a particular product is incredibly challenging and is incredibly complex. So that is one of the huge issues of uh, internal auditing as well as that it gets very complicated very quickly because you have full access to everything. Uh, the other issue is that, you know, with internal auditing, uh, you 
there, there's a lot of liability concerns. So an example of this is with demographic categories where you're not sure how to, uh, you know, uh, categorize race or categorize gender. Uh, you can't necessarily collect demographic information because of concern for liability issues. So testing, you know, for bias in certain contexts becomes very tricky uh, uh, while maintaining legal compatibility. So um, that's another sort of issue with inter internal auditing. So, you know, given all these, you know, potential challenges with auditing, you know, what else can we do? And another thing that we can do to hold companies to account with respect to their, you know, obligations for engineering responsibilities, regulate them. Uh, and this is very much something that happened post gender shades. There was a wave of uh, regulatory proposals for facial recognition, you know, bans and uh, facial recognition restrictions uh, throughout the US. Uh, we worked very closely with the ACLU on, uh, you know, their, their CCOPS campaign where they were aiming to equip a bunch of uh, municipal governments with the ability to restrict police use of face surveillance. Um, and, you know, right after we had released the audit, there were a bunch of these headlines. Uh, some of these were actually blog posts by the tech companies themselves saying like, you know, we want regulation in response to the audit work we had done. They were sort of calling for uh, the need to be regulated. Uh, you know, but there's, there's challenges with this idea of regulation as a way to hold these companies to account. So, you know, one issue or one limitation is that uh, the companies are actually quite influential in terms of uh, uh, defining regulation. So, uh, you know, for one thing, uh, companies are constantly paying lobbyists to uh, shape these uh, regulations. So, you know, here's a screenshot of the you know, Commercial Facial Recognition Privacy Act from 2019. And there's like two Amazon lobbyists, every Congress bill um, related to facial recognition, there's at least two or three Amazon lobbyists. And, um, you know, I've had a situation where I was, you know, sitting at a meeting, uh, there was an Amazon lobbyist, because it was a policy meeting. And uh, he, he mentioned that he used to be a Kamala Harris aide, <laughs> meaning that, you know, he was actually on the committee that drafted the bill that he's now an Amazon lobbyist on. <laughs> so there's all of these dynamics that exist in just the reality of, you know, the lawmaking world. Um, and now Kamala Harris, uh, who has, you know, a lot of close ties to big tech is <laughs> vice president. So, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, dynamics that exist with uh, regulation that makes it really difficult to actually use that as the primary mechanism of holding, you know, companies to account. Uh, there's also the fact that, you know, these companies are very influential on their stakeholders, uh, you know, even if regulation can uh, cause a certain amount of uh, movement towards accountability, uh, Amazon is still sort of very influential uh, in terms of public opinion, media, and stakeholder action. So here's an example of when, uh, you know, a bunch of Amazon activist shareholders uh, you know, proposed uh, a vote uh, to, to ban the, the company's sale of facial recognition to police. Uh, and the SEC, uh, you know, Amazon tried to stop that vote. The SEC said, no, they must have this vote. Um, Amazon tried to appeal. The SEC said, no, <laughs> they must have the vote. Uh, and then Amazon kind of launched a very sort of rigorous campaign, uh, you know, uh, highly recommending shareholders vote uh, against that, that motion. And uh, in the end, shareholders did vote against the motion and Amazon uh, continued to sell facial recognition. So uh, yeah, so we can tell that, you know, even when regulation allows for some of these accountability challenges to happen, uh, you know, the companies are still influential in other ways. So aside from, uh, you know, regulation and audits, uh, we can also try a recall. So a recall is, uh, you know, uh, probably most familiar to a lot of people in, you know, the food industry or uh, the automobile industry, but it's this idea of identifying that a product has been defective and then retrieving it from customers for their protection. Um, so it sort of, you know, it, it, it ranges from an outright ban to um, the sort of voluntary opt-out or voluntary self-return or replacement. Um, and the recall itself can be mandatory. Um, by sort of mandated by a regulatory body or it could be voluntary, a decision made by the company itself. Um, and we actually saw a bit of a recall happen with facial recognition where um, 
at the height of the George Floyd protest, there was a lot of attention paid to facial recognition technology used by the police. And uh, suddenly these companies found themselves in an uncomfortable position where they were calling for regulation, but they were still selling the technology to police clients. So um, because of a lot of advocacy that happened or that was happening at the same time, the companies actually decided to recall their products. So uh, IBM, Amazon, and Microsoft all ended up sort of pulling their products out of the market to some degree. Um, and in Amazon's case, sort of committing to pausing the sale of their, their product to police for, for a year. Um, so this is like an, you know, the closest example we have so far of a of, of voluntary recall of the product in response to the critique. Uh, you know, the challenge with this is that it took two years <laughs> to get there. Um, you know, Amazon started off being very defensive and it, it was only after two years that they were really able to, um, uh, you know, be pressured or cornered into the position of a voluntary recall. So it's not necessarily something that we can depend on as a, you know, reliable form of accountability. Uh, the other thing as well is that, you know, Amazon released their blog posts saying, you know, we're implementing a one-year moratorium on police use of recognition, but they still at the same time partnered with, you know, 400 police forces, uh, you know, through their, their product, their, their smart doorbell product ring and offered facial recognition services as part of that process. So there's all kinds of loopholes that companies can create for themselves when they set up a voluntary recall. So uh, it, it's not a perfect form of accountability. Uh, and then I'm going to very quickly in a couple minutes, just talk about other challenges outside of engineering responsibility. So as a reminder, you know, engineering responsibility are sort of these issues where, you know, the actor in the situation is really the company that's building these products that are causing harm, and we want to hold them to account. But there's actually other challenges outside of that, that we need to think about. So, you know, engineering responsibility is a situation where those that built the algorithm are those that we're trying to hold to account. There's other situations where, you know, uh, uh, we, have, we actually want to think about operator accountability, where those making use of the algorithm, the institutions making use or the individuals making use of the algorithm are the ones that we want to hold to account. And then there's also, you know, issues of like structural harms where, you know, the historical legacies and norms of society at large are, is what we want to hold to account. So the, the analogy I sort of give for this is um, with cars, my favorite sort of analogy, <laughs> where, uh, you know, if you think of engineering responsibility as the car manufacturer building a car where the brakes don't work, um, operator accountability is maybe a situation with a drunk driver where, you know, you have uh, someone that, that the car is sort of perfectly functional, but the person making use of the car is acting in a way that's irresponsible and that's putting people at risk. Um, and then in that case, the person that you have to hold to account is the drunk driver. Um, and then if you want to think about, you know, structural harms, you know, you have cars that are sort of widely deployed, you know, they cause a lot of pollution, um, you know, they, they flatten our cities with, you know, the implementation of roads. Uh, and those are sort of like st structural elements as a byproduct of the mass deployment of cars that you want to challenge, that you want to, you want to hold uh, decision makers about those structural elements to account. So that's kind of um, an analogy of how these different challenges might interface with each other. There's like a different dynamic when you're holding the manufacturer to account versus, you know, the individual drivers versus, you know, the forces that establish these sort of infrastructural or structural issues or harms. So um, I don't have much time, so I'm just going to go very quickly over what I mean by these things. Um, this is not a huge focus of our work right now, but I just want to mention it for those that are that might be thinking about it. So the operator accountability is, you know, holding to account those that use these tools irresponsibly. So an example is, you know, police departments that might be feeding sketch images into a facial recognition product that is not designed for that purpose, and then misidentifying individuals as a result. There's a great um, report on, you know, the misuse of facial recognition technology by police departments uh, by Georgetown Law called Garbage In, Garbage Out. I highly recommend that. Um, also, you know, with Amazon's facial recognition tool, uh, you know, someone, a, a reporter interviewed one of their police clients and their police client was like, what, what is a threshold? You know, they, they had no idea what um, Amazon's recommended guidance was around the use of the technology. So that's a situation where you can start thinking about how the operator's uh, lack of, you know, conscious responsible action kind of puts people at risk. There's also a lot of situations of, you know, intentional misuse and abuse where you have, you know, landlords using facial recognition to harass their tenants, um, you know, uh, a, a situation where, you know, there's those 
developing facial recognition to potentially target and harass particular minority groups. So here's a situation where those making use of the technology are doing so and causing harm. Uh, there's also issues of a lack of disclosure. Uh, NYPD, uh, this is really the, the, the sort of basis of the post act in, in New York, where uh, NYPD was deploying facial recognition without any notice uh, to any of the individuals affected or any of the neighbors, neighbor, neighborhoods affected. Um, so that's another way in which, you know, the operator of the technology is acting irresponsibly and needs to be held to account. Uh, and then I'll just make a final mention of the sort of other challenges, structural harms, like I mentioned, uh, you know, society not being built to protect the vulnerable and how we can really challenge that. So this is a huge issue in machine learning. If I look up, you know, beautiful skin, I can see the lack of diversity in the results. Um, and that's just something that is sort of a recurring phenomenon in the data sets that we often use in the space where, you know, every black athlete is, you know, classified as playing basketball while uh, you know, other, other individuals are classified playing the correct sport. So there's so many ways in which stereotypes are embedded in the data sets that just naturally occur from media representations. Uh, we also have the issue uh, uh, of you know, a lot of these data sets, including really offensive derogatory labels, you know, the N-word, uh, you know, all kinds of slurs um, labeled on real faces. Um, so this is, this is another way in which data sets can kind of just engulf you know society's uh, prejudice views uh, and then there's also sort of this challenge uh in terms of just structural harms and issues of structural harm uh you know we have these issues where you know the law is not really really built to actually get to accountability on some of these issues so you know amazon built an ai recruiting tool that was biased against women but um you know the case against that kind of falls flat because you know the algorithm itself is not um, uh, under current sort of legal anti-discrimination frameworks, it's very difficult to hold the algorithm to account for some of the decisions that it made uh, against those female candidates. Um, similarly, HUD suing Facebook um, and you know Facebook sort of continuing to discriminate uh, against worker uh, against women and older workers, um, but also um, uh, you know in housing, uh, despite these these lawsuits, just because uh, there's there's no legal structure to really hold them to account in the long term. Um, and then also sometimes just legal structures work against us doing the auditing work. So uh, here's an example of you know Christian Sandvig, uh, who is a researcher uh, that worked with the ACLU uh, to actually uh, get an exception to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, for researchers. Uh, computer scientists and journalists wishing to investigate companies' online practices. So in the past, we actually put ourselves at legal risk um, by, you know, interacting with an API to audit a system or to hack into a system in order to audit it um, because of these anti-hacking laws. Um, and, you know, it interferes with the work of journalists as well. Here's uh, Julia Ang Angwin from the markup celebrating um, you know, uh, the Supreme Court's uh, hearing arguments on, on um, you know, why the CFAA should be relaxed to allow us to do our accountability work. Um, and then, you know, finally, in terms of just uh, structural issues, there's this issue of uh, victim compensation and protection where, um, you know, Robert Williams, like I mentioned earlier, is, you know, a, a man in the US that was, you know, wrongfully misidentified by a facial recognition system. But because of, you know, the climate of racial dynamics in the US, that easily, he was sort of more at risk of that situation escalating to a false arrest, which it did. And after that happened, you know, there was no uh, mechanisms in place for him to seek compensation or protection. And it's because, you know, this is not, th these are emerging situations. This is not a situation that's uh, been common in the past or that we've been able to identify in the past. So there's a huge hole in terms of how we think through that. And that's a very structural harm where it puts individuals at risk where they don't know who to look to they don't know how to identify these situations and they don't know how to get um, any protection as individuals. And uh, that's just a, a structural issue we need to address. Uh, so yeah, I guess the final thing to remember is that um, even with the Quebec bridge, you know, um, uh, you know, when it collapsed, you know, 75 people died, but of, of those 75 construction workers, um, you know, I think about 55 of them, the, the majority of them were, uh, you know, local native American workers that were, you know, drastically underpaid. Um, and what this 
demonstrated to me was just that, you know, when you build these structures and they collapse and they fail or they hurt people, they tend to hurt, uh, you know, those that are the least um, able to, to, to push back and to hold them to account. So, you know, the people that consistently get hurt in a lot of the cases that we investigate or that we feature or that we work on are, are those that are, you know, you know, minorities that are, you know, like people with disabilities, people of color, low income individuals that just have the least agency and are provided with the least knowledge about how these systems work. So it just kind of reinforces the need to address these issues um, and really hold, um, you know, these uh, different stakeholders to account for the harm that they cause to these real people. Uh, so yeah, in, in, in conclusion, you know, machine learning doesn't work until it works for everyone. And we need to really pay attention to the risks involved um, by multiple stakeholders and really hold them to account. Thank you.